I pray that I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Which of us, wandering through the lovely German countryside and coming unawares upon a crucifix, does not feel deep in his heart a strange but enduring sense of shame? The gods of our ancestors were different. They were men and carried in their hands a weapon which typified the natural tendencies of our race, namely readiness to get and self-reliance. How different is yonder pale figure on the cross whose passivity and aspect of suffering express only humility and self-abnegation, qualities which we, conscious of our heroic blood, utterly deny. The corruption of our blood caused by the intrusion of this alien philosophy must be ended. Those words were spoken in 1937 by Heinrich Himmler to a Hitler Youth Rally. Words that play off the strong Aryan race with the perceived weakness of Christ. It is true that in the Gospels, until his passion, Jesus is always giving of himself, his time, his energy, his care, his belief in people, or his challenge of them. But in the Passion, the tables are turned, and he becomes passive, placed into others' hands, and he becomes a receiver of gifts. We probably think of gifts being given to Jesus by the Magi at birth, but in the Passion story, 30 or so years later, there are gifts given to him again but which are often overlooked. We will hear them over the coming days, the seven gifts of the Passion. First, today, the donkey, the Palm Sunday donkey. There is no doubt but that Jesus used that donkey in two ways. The first was to take all the steam out of the political campaign that would have placed him at the head of a rebellious crowd and used him as a symbol of resistance against the Romans. That was what all the fuss was about as Jesus entered Jerusalem. The waving of the palm branches, the loud hosannas, the crowd has been manipulated by resistant leaders to see in Jesus the hope of a political Messiah, a secular savior. But he quite deliberately diffuses that conspiracy by riding into Jerusalem not as a conqueror on a stallion, as Pilate would have been doing at the same time on the other side of the city to keep control over the Passover crowds, but rather as a man of humility and peace on a gentle donkey. This, as the prophet Zechariah had foretold, was the symbol of the true king of kings, the true savior, the Messiah who comes in humility and not in pomp, because a proud humanity can only be saved by a humble God. Then came the second gift, the box or jar of scented ointment given, St. John tells us, by Mary of Bethany, anointing Jesus for his passion. She was somehow aware that what was developing could only end in death. And as Jesus went on his way in some loneliness, 
she gives him a most precious gift, the gift of sensitive understanding, a tenderness, a refreshment, a moment of love to say she understands and is there with him. The upper room came next as a gift. Jesus needed somewhere to have a last meal of fellowship with his disciples. The Maundy Thursday gift of the upper room was the setting for the institution of what we call the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, the sacrament, which would sustain his disciples through the terrible events which were to come and which has been the foundation and the sustenance of the Church of Christ ever since. Then there were the four gifts of Good Friday. When Jesus faltered under the weight of the cross, Simon of Cyrene gave him the gift of his shoulder. He took and shared the Lord's burden. It's only a tradition, but a very ancient one, that subsequently Simon became a Christian himself. But all that matters for our purposes is that here he moved in, ignoring everyone else around, to make his gift as Christ stumbled, and Jesus has the grace to accept it. The fifth was equally unexpected. It was a word of encouragement from a thief dying on a cross by the side of Jesus. For a moment, he rises above his own pain, and he asked not for a share in the redemption that he was hearing about, but simply to be remembered by Jesus, who gave him in return the pledge that that same day the thief would be with him in paradise. Words dared spoken connect them not for a moment, but it seems forever. The sixth gift came a little later. It was a drink, part of a soldier's ration. It was given by a man whom we might have expected to have been hardened to suffering, especially the suffering of the people whose land his army was occupying. Yet as he watched the Galilean die, he was strangely moved to do something to ease his agony. Like all of us, Jesus is thirsting for some kindness as well as for water thirsts to be seen as he is, a man nearing his death. The last gift was a tomb given by Joseph of Arimathea, who had long been an admirer of Jesus, even though he had not dared to make that admiration public. But now, somehow, he was given the courage to make a very public declaration of his esteem with the offer of his own tomb as a resting place for the Lord. And as with all the gifts of the Passion, his was accepted and transformed into the service of Christ. The gifts of the Passion and just as the carols at Christmas ask us what we would bring to the infant Christ, so these gifts are scrutinizing us, what we shall bring to the crucified Lord. That donkey, the sign of humility, pleads with us for some humility too, in this loud, strident, arrogant world. Nor is the box of ointment outside our experience. Mary alone, perhaps amongst the people gathered at Bethany, saw beyond her own perceptions into the need of Jesus. 
how much we too need to be able at the moment to see beyond the limits of our own circumference into the loneliness, the despair, the agony of other people. The Maundy Thursday upper room is every church, is every dwelling where Christ is at home. He is the unseen guest who is with us. In fact, the upper room can also be your heart and mine. Is Christ welcome there? And is all that we think and say and do an acceptable offering there? And those gifts of Good Friday, the shoulder, the word of encouragement, the drink, the tomb, well, they are all gifts which cost the givers a good deal in terms of money or pain or sensitivity or courage. But the thing that haunts me about those four Good Friday gifts is that they all came from people outside of Jesus' own band of disciples and friends. On the last day of his earthly life, it is strangers who come to his help. It is his friends, his followers, who let him down. I look at the church today and shamedly wonder whether something of that is true now. Jesus receives comfort and care from the foreigner, the criminal, the soldier, and a Jewish opponent. His disciples fall asleep during his pain in the garden. They run away when danger comes. Peter denies him when challenged about his allegiance. These are chilling facts because they're too much like a mirror. From Monday to Wednesday this week, we will be looking here at three poems in the evenings that ask of us who we are becoming, what we're turning into. But the poetry of the passion, the poetry of the Gospels, begins that scrutiny asking if the gifts Jesus received might yet be the gifts the church offers, the gifts that you and I offer. Himmler dismissed Jesus because he was not a northern god of war, self-reliant, a master of the fittest. But we see in the Passion how humanity is saved when we give and receive from one another. Christ receives what we are able to give so the world can be transformed just a little more. Far from being a religion of weaklings, this makes our faith a faith of courage and of hope and of sacrifice. It makes us non-negotiable in our belief in the dignity of each and every person, their need simply a small mirror of our own. I started with Himmler. I shall end with Father Dmitry Kelpinin, a Russian priest who, along with Mother Maria Skopsova, worked in Paris during the Nazi occupation, providing French Jews with forged papers, forged baptism certificates to assist their escape. Mother Maria is known in the Orthodox tradition very beautifully as the saint of the open door. When Father Dimitri was arrested, he was interrogated for four hours. He made no attempt to renounce what he had done. He was offered his freedom on the condition that he helped no more Jews. 
Do you know any Jews? He was asked by the interrogator. Father Dimitri raised the cross that was around his neck and pointing to the figure on it said, yes, this one. He was answered with a blow to the face. Both Mother Maria and Father Dimitri died in the camps. Eyewitnesses recalled the way Father Dimitri was mocked by the SS, beating him and calling him Jew. It is Christian faith and witness like this that are strong, for silence is never neutral. And in Christ, such fidelity is a gift. The donkey rides on past the Caesar Augustuses, the Pontius Pilots, the baying crowds, and the Himmlers, as he did at the start, so now. He bids us follow. Poetry is a scary word for many people. It has too many bad memories of school attached, or it conjures up thoughts of a language that is not as we know it, too complicated, too opaque, and you don't even get many words for your money when you buy a book of poems. There's a lot of space going on around those words. And yet, when we need a language that matters after a national tragedy, at a wedding or a funeral, when working with young offenders or introducing the world to young children, or being alongside the person in the hospice, we turn to this language for its distillation and epiphanies, its connection to a deeper, even better part of us that tells us somehow that these words understand us. These words are listening to us even. Seamus Heaney once said that poets are on the side of undeceiving the world. And that's why poetry is the native language of faith. And why in these three addresses I want to look at three poems that I believe are committed to that undeceiving of the world and our poetic warnings to us today. I believe that God loves us just as we are. I also believe that God loves us so much, God doesn't want us to stay like that. We are works in progress and self-scrutiny is part of our human becoming. God gives us our being, and in return, we give back our becoming, who we are shaping into. So we will have three poems over the next three evenings, slightly longer poems than some, and poems which put us on alert as to who we are or might turn into if the compass of goodness that leads us homeward ever gets forgotten. Tonight, the poem is W. H. Auden's Refugee Blues. It was first published in 1939. Refugee Blues. Say this city has 10 million souls. Some are living in mansions, some are living in holes. Yet there's no place for us, my dear. Yet there's no place for us. 
Once we had a country and we thought it fair. Look in the atlas and you'll find it there. We cannot go there now, my dear. We cannot go there now. In the village churchyard there grows an old yew. Every spring it blossoms anew. Old passports can't do that, my dear. Old passports can't do that. The consul banged the table and said, if you've got no passport, you're officially dead. But we are still alive, my dear. But we are still alive. Went to a committee. They offered me a chair. Asked me politely to return next year. But where shall we go today, my dear? But where shall we go today? came to a public meeting, the speaker got up and said, if we let them in, they will steal our daily bread. He was talking of you and me, my dear. He was talking of you and me. Thought I heard the thunder rumbling in the sky. It was Hitler over Europe saying they must die. Oh, we were in his mind, my dear. We were in his mind. Saw a poodle in a jacket, fastened with a pin. Saw a door opened and a cat let in. But they weren't German Jews, my dear. But they weren't German Jews. Went down the harbour and stood upon the quay. Saw the fish swimming as if they were free. Only ten feet away, my dear. Only ten feet away. Walked through a wood, saw the birds in the trees. They had no politicians and sang at their ease. They weren't the human race, my dear. They weren't the human race. Dreamt I saw a building with a thousand floors, a thousand windows and a thousand doors. Not one of them was ours, my dear. Not one of them was ours. Stood on a great plain in the falling snow. 10,000 soldiers marched to and fro, looking for you and me, my dear, looking for you and me. This poem accommodates a varying tone of resignation, disturbance, and menace. In stanza four, the necessity of a passport for a refugee was well known to Auden as he had married Erika Mann in 1935 in order to provide her with one. The great Auden scholar, Edward Mendelssohn, says of Auden that he welcomed into his poetry all the disordered conditions of his time, all its variety of language, even while he resisted the tendency characteristic of his time to perceive human beings as the product of collective, instinctive, and archetypal forces, rather than as individuals who think, choose, and feel. The disordered conditions of his time it made me reflect. Blessed are the meek. Matthew Shepard was an American student at the University of Wyoming. 25 years ago, at the age of 21, he went out for a drink, and at the end of the evening, two men offered to give him a ride home. They did not take him home. Instead, they drove him to a remote rural area. They hit him on the head continuously with blunt weapons, tortured him, and then tied him to a fence. They left him there in freezing temperatures. Matt was there for 18 hours in a coma until a cyclist saw him and thought he was a scarecrow. Getting closer, he saw a young man with his face completely covered in blood 
except for where his tears had partially cleansed his cheeks. Matt was taken to hospital. His injuries were too severe for him to be operated on. He lay on life support for six days until at 12.53 a.m. on October the 12th, 1998, he was pronounced dead. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Matt Shepherd was gay. His killers knew that. His killers didn't like that. Other people didn't like that. At Matt's funeral, his parents had to walk past members of the Westboro Baptist Church, holding placards that said, Matt's in hell, and God hates fags. His parents decided not to bury Matt's ashes anywhere because they believed that his grave would be defaced. They kept Matt's remains at home. He could have been black. He could have been Asian. He could have been Jewish, Muslim, Sikh. He could have been disabled. He could have been you, but he was Matt, and he happened to be gay. Blessed are those that mourn. Matt's parents kept his ashes at home until just six years ago. On October the 26th, 2018, at Washington Cathedral, 20 years after his death, Matt's ashes were carried into a full cathedral. At a service full of lament and color, sadness and resolve, Matt's remains were finally laid to rest in the cathedral. I visited his resting place just a few months ago. The preacher at that service was Bishop Jean Robinson who recalled the day when five years after Matt's death, he was consecrated as the first openly gay bishop in the Episcopal Church. He was in the vestry, putting on a bulletproof vest, as the FBI had told him he must because there had been just too many death threats received against him. And as he was putting the vest on, a note arrived from Matt's mother I know Matt is smiling down on you today, it said. Bishop Jean kept it with him through the service. The vest, however, had to remain on for several months. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's said that we live in a world of identity politics when we seek clarity on who we are. In such a world, there will always be those who use this for their own purposes and point to others, at worst, victimize others for who they are not. Matt was known for not being straight and the list of people who know they are seen often for what they are not is very long defined by not being white, not being clever, not being physically the same, not being British or sporty or Western, not quite fitting in, not being born here, not being like the local majority. We label people as not being like us. Instead of us defining ourselves with and for others, we stand over and against them. They are other. This can then mean they are not really human as we are, and so we can do anything we like to them. And the violence takes many forms, isolation, teasing, bullying, to mental, spiritual, physical abuse, to leaving someone tied to a fence with their skull broken, 
or nailed to two pieces of wood with thorns pushed into your face. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You may sit here now knowing what others think of you because of what you aren't. But you sit here with God who knows exactly all you are and can yet be and loves you for it. Matt was an Anglican Christian and wonderfully his church loved him and showed him that no matter whatever happens, no matter whatever anybody says or thinks, the love of God for him was certain and true and forever, even beyond death. At the end of his sermon, the bishop in tears said he had three things to say to Matt in that cathedral. Gently rest in peace here. You are safe now. Welcome home. Blessed are the merciful. The bishop then told the congregation that if they thought being there at the service was enough, they had misunderstood. They were there to be transformed by what had happened and to leave the place to make sure these things don't happen again and that means working out how you will vote, what you need to challenge, what you need to support, who you need to look at again, who you need to be alongside, and seeing too who you need to help you get through this life, people who will remind you of the love of God for you. If you don't stand for, any, for something, you might fall for anything. So don't fall, not us, in here, with a belief in God-given dignity for all, for God's sake. Stand and stand up now for an end to such hate and for a love of people in all their wonderful difference a love for people who need that love at the moment because there's too much hate of others who don't fit in with my world going on. Through the days of this week, we will hear from the Lord that when I am lifted up, I shall draw all people to myself, all people. God gives us diversity. The tragedy is we make division of it. Matthew's mother on the day of the internment said, for the past 20 years we have shared Matt's story with the world. It's reassuring to know he now will rest in a sacred spot where folks can come to reflect on creating a safer, kinder world. Safer, kinder. All of us here in our lives have needed refuge at some point, sought refuge of love, refuge of understanding or safety. Some are needing the refuge of a new life because death or persecution or hunger or war are all making life a living death. How we as people, individuals or society, treat those seeking safety, how we speak to them, about them, how we see them as like us or as other, as we process their appeal to us. All this takes the temperature of our soul before God in whom we take refuge time and time again. When Jesus tells us to love our enemies, he's telling us to love those who bear our shadow. He's telling us to see our shadow and the damage it does when unrecognized. Not long ago, 
Washington Cathedral unveiled a commissioned portrait of Matthew. Working with his remarkable parents, the artist depicted him without any golden halo. Instead, Matt is surrounded by a multicolored tapestry of written prayers and letters of support that his parents received over the years. He's wearing his favorite shirt that his parents gave him for Christmas. Bishop Jean was there again. What we have here is very typical of what God does, he said. God takes a terrible thing like Good Friday and brings something amazing and miraculous out of it like Easter. In the end, love wins. It may not look like it right now. The odds may be against it, but our confidence as Christians is that in the end, God gets the last word, and that last word is love. Blessed are the peacemakers. The policewoman who was called out to the scene of Matt's attack says that as she approached the fence, she saw something next to his body. It was a deer lying quietly beside him. It looked like it had been there all night long. She said the deer saw her, stood up, looked her right in the eyes, and then ran off. She wrote in her official report, that was the good Lord, no doubt, no doubt in my mind, she said, that was the good Lord. We are looking over these three evenings at poems that warn us as to who or what we might be becoming as individuals or society. This evening we hear Louis McNeese's poem, Prayer Before Birth, written in 1944, in which an unborn child is praying I am not yet born, O oh, hear me. Let not the blood-sucking bat, or the rat, or the stoat, or the club-footed ghoul come near me. I am not yet born, console me. I fear that the human race may with tall walls wall me, with strong drugs dope me with wise lies lure me, on black racks rack me, in blood baths roll me. I am not yet born. Provide me with water to dandle me, grass to grow for me, trees to talk to me, sky to sing to me, birds and a white light in the back of my mind to guide me. I am not yet born. Forgive me for the sins that in me the world shall commit. My words when they speak me, my thoughts when they think me, my treason engendered by traitors beyond me, my life when they murder by means of my hands, my death when they live me. I am not yet born. Rehearse me in the parts I must play and the cues I must take when old men lecture me, bureaucrats hector me, mountains frown at me, lovers laugh at me, the white waves call me to folly and the desert calls me to doom and the beggar refuses my gift and my children curse me. 
I am not yet born, oh hear me. Let not the man who is beast or who thinks he is God come near me. I am not yet born, oh fill me with strength against those who would freeze my humanity, would dragoon me into a lethal automaton, would make me a cog in a machine, a thing with one face, a thing, and against all those who would dissipate my entirety, would blow me like thistledown hither and thither, or hither and thither, like water held in the hands would spill me. Let them not make me a stone, and let them not spill me, otherwise kill me. The English poet of the First World War, Wilfred Owen, once said that all a poet can do today is warn. That is why he said the true poets must be truthful. Louis McNeese, writing Prayer Before Birth some years later during the Second World War, agreed with Owen. In fact, this poem powerfully embodies Owen's plea for honesty and for warning. McNeese was born in Belfast to a father who was to become a Church of Ireland bishop. My father made the walls resound. He wore his collar the wrong way round, he says in one poem. And a mother who, suffering depression, entered a nursing home when he was six years old and whom he never saw again due to her death shortly afterwards from tuberculosis. McNeese's childhood naturally had a shaping effect on the person he became in adult life. He was a detached outsider, skeptical of God, of fixed systems and abstractions, an acute observer, with but not strictly of the company, as his work colleague put it. Like many individualists in a world threatened by fascism, communism, and the lies that war creates, as we are seeing today, McNeese could see that his personal values, such as he could fathom them, were becoming less relevant and in jeopardy. He was also doubtful of any armchair reformists, or as we might call them, virtue signalers. In 1944, he published Prayer Before Birth, in which the poet takes on the persona of an unborn child. It is a poem to read out loud, so you can fully grasp the assonance of images, such as tall walls, wise lies, and black racks. Although it is free verse, with lines and verses of varying lengths and rhyme patterns, the high level of repetition and the use of the word me as the last word of the first and last line of each stanza gives a very strong rhythmic backbone to the whole. Indeed, the poem is struggling hard to keep me in the picture when so much is working against me. Each stanza except the last is a single sentence and again, there's almost a crazed litany feel to the poem, an anguished plea from the other side of the womb. The repeated, oh, cry, as well as the statement, I am not yet born, alongside the frequent alliteration, give it almost a religious formality as it evokes God, or maybe the powers of the universe. But this is a protest poem, not only against war, but against the raw animal in nature and in humanity. In the first stanza, where the unborn child asks to be heard, he prays that the nocturnal 
blood-sucking bat, rat and stoat don't come near. The child needs consoling because of fears that the human race also will, with deadly drugs and clever lies, wall him in, dope him, lure, rack and roll him in blood. Innocent nature is juxtaposed with such violence and bloodlust as he asks for water and grass and trees and sky and birds and light to guide him. The child seems to know the power that human life will have over him once he's born and asks for forgiveness for when the world, rather than himself and his conscience, speaks through him. He can see the opposition he will face from old men lecturing him and bureaucrats hectoring and lovers laughing at him and even his children cursing him. And then, of course, there is a very direct reference to those European dictators that were in full flow as this poem was written. Let not the man who is beast or who thinks he is God come near me. He wants no part in a collaboration with totalitarian regimes that thrive on fear and regimentation, but realizes that being humane is, as it were, not for beginners. It requires resilience and courage and an inner compass of steel. The poem is full of imperatives as the child calls for help. Of course, we can think of these men who are beasts and think they are God. In our own day, there are plenty of them and maybe one or two more before long. And because they all in their way shape the world and shape the way we think and behave, we must, as Christians here, ensure whose kingdom we are ultimately breathing and living in, whose language we use, whose worldview we consent to, whose aspirations and ideals and moral vision we strive for. Caesar and God are, at the end of the day, not on the same side of the coin. Finally, the child prays that he will be filled with strength and be able to stand up against all those people, systems and ideologies that would simmer down human life by categorizing it, making it an automaton or lost in the crowd, all those things that, he says, would freeze my humanity. At the end, he asks that the world will not harden him into an unfeeling animal or spill him like something easily wasted and expendable. If this is going to happen, he ends eerily, then kill me. Whether McNeese's view of humanity is too dark and negative is debatable, although the times in which he wrote surely allowed him to see the real consequences of our potential for evil. It is one of the hard lessons of Christian faith that just as standing in a garage doesn't make you a car, so sitting in a church doesn't make you a Christian. It is the transformation of the heart and mind and the translation of that change into our behavior that the gospel invites us to. This means that from time to time, in sometimes small, sometimes courageous ways, we have to take a stand and confront what is unjust. This is sometimes called speaking truth to power but it's not as simple as that, because often those who have the power already know the truth, but are choosing to ignore it or reframe it. So often the powerful, including those who write the political scripts we hear, or the adverts we read, have hypnotized the culture, so that one of the vocations of the church is to carefully scrutinize what everyone is getting excited about at a certain time 
or what everybody just takes for granted as being common sense. It's all part of Heaney's undeceiving the world. What keys do you hold to open doors for people? Because I promise you, you have them. Christian witness often has the reputation for being pushy and know it all. In the Bible, though, the ones who end up speaking for God and God's justice are usually pretty unsure of themselves. Moses stammered, Jeremiah was melancholic at best, Jonah ran off, and Isaiah was convinced he was utterly unworthy. Many of us Christians are introverts at home in the inner landscape and not naturally keen to put our neck out. We cannot escape the call, though, to confront what is corrupt. This may be an injustice at work or the need to speak up for someone who's voiceless. Christians then need to make our fears our agenda because it is fear that so often stops us from witnessing to what is right and good. It's so much easier to yak on about churchy politics and titbits. Fear of the bully, of our reputation, of upsetting someone, of being isolated. These are all genuine anxieties and need to be recognized by us first if justice is to ever win the day. How do we undo the illusions of the day without becoming disillusioned? The answer for me is by faith in the gospel that ruptures the stale and unforgiving landscape with potential and promise. The gospel is not some sort of fire insurance policy for the next world. It is a life assurance policy for this one. I was very moved and humbled to hear Geoffrey John on the radio a few years back say this. I have a memory from my school days that still haunts me. One year we had a boy in our class, I'll call him David. He was a pathetic kid, weedy, rather effeminate, and his life was hell. Children can be incredibly cruel to anyone who's different, and David was a brilliant target. He was beaten up, he got his lunch thrown away, he got called girls' names, and he always sat on his own. I can hardly think of the misery that kid must have gone through. Now, I never beat him up, I never called him names. The fact it was happening used to churn my stomach. But I never said or did a thing to help him because, of course, I was terrified that if I did, they'd turn on me too and I'd get the same treatment. And, of course, that's how it works in so many bad situations in the world. And, yes, in the church too. We know what's happening is wrong, but we keep our heads down and hope someone else will do the martyr bit and face down the bullies with the truth. There is a way of being human that does not allow fear to be the last word. Those we admire most are usually those who live with this integrity where belief and behavior coincide. Jesus was constantly being criticized and was eventually executed for interrupting the unchallenged narratives of the powerful with the truth and dignity of the vulnerable and overlooked. He did not so much answer questions as question answers. And to follow him means to do the same in our day and in our own way. We're told not to meddle in politics as if faith is not about real life. But if Jesus was just a nice guy, why did they execute him? As a Franciscan blessing invokes, may God bless us 
with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation. May God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world, doing in his name what others claim cannot be done. To read a poem such as Prayer Before Birth helps us see just what forces, conscious and unconscious, can be at work in us and the world at large. It can help us recall that human beings have a will. Recently, I gave a talk to a clergy conference and an elderly priest got up and said he had something to say something to tell everyone. He had, he said, just been in hospital after a heart attack. And as he lay on the hospital bed, he said, in his words, my whole life flashed before me. But the thing is, I wasn't in it. I realized I have not been in my own life. I've been absorbed hiding. I've been full of fear. Please, my brothers and sisters, he said, don't let this be you. He seemed to be saying, I am not yet born, even though over 70 years had passed. His was not the prayer of the unborn child. It was the prayer of one nearing the other journey we take in life. I am not yet born. O oh, fill me with strength against those that would freeze my humanity, would dragoon me into a lethal automaton, would make me a cog in a machine, a thing with one face, a thing. You might like to know that Louis McNeese died at the age of 56. And after a funeral at St. John's Wood Church in London, his remains were taken back to Ireland and placed next to his mother. We look tonight at the last of the three poems I'm using to show how poets can warn us about who we are becoming. The poem is called Missing God and is by Dennis Driscoll who died in 2012. Missing God. His grace is no longer called for before meals Farmed fish multiply without his intercession. Bread production rises through disease-resistant grains devised scientifically to mitigate his faults. Yet, though we rebelled against him like adolescents, uplifted to see an oppressive father banished, a bearded hermit, to the desert, we confess to missing him at times. Miss him during the civil wedding when at the blossomy altar of the registrar's desk we wait in vain to be fed a line containing words like everlasting and divine. Miss him when the TV scientist explains the cosmos through equations leaving our planet to revolve on its axis aimlessly 
a wheel skidding in snow. Miss him when the radio catches a snatch of plain chant from some echoey priory. When the gospel choir raises its collective voice to ask, shall we gather at the river? All the forces of the oratorio converge on, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and our contracted hearts lose a beat. Miss him when a choked voice at the crematorium recites the poem about fearing no more the heat of the sun. Miss him when we stand in judgment on a lank crucifixion in an art museum, its stripe-like ribs testifying to rank. Miss him when the gamma rays recorded on the satellite graph seem arranged into a celestial score, the music of the spheres, the Ave Verum corpus of the observatory lab. Miss him when we stumble on the breast lump for the first time and an involuntary prayer escapes our lips. When a shadow crosses our bodies on an x-ray screen, when we receive a transfusion of foaming blood sacrificed anonymously to save life. Miss him when we call out his name spontaneously in awe or anger as a woman in a birth ward bawls her long dead mother's name. Miss him when the linen covered dining table holds warm bread rolls, shiny glasses of red wine. Miss him when a dove swoops in the orange grove in a tourist village just as the monastery bell begins to take its toll. Miss him when our journey leads us under leaves of gothic tracery, an arch of overlapping branches that meet like hands in Michelangelo's creation. Miss him when trudging past a church we catch a residual blast of incense a perfume on par with the fresh-baked loaf which Miloch compared to happiness. Miss him when our newly decorated kitchen comes in shaker style and we order a matching set of Mother Anne Lee chairs. Miss him when we listen to the prophecy of astronomers that the visible galaxies will recede as the universe expands. Miss him the way an uncoupled glider riding the evening thermals misses its tug. Miss him as the lovers shrugging shoulders outside the cheap hotel ponder what their next move should be. Even feel nostalgic odd days for his second coming like standing in the brick dome of a dovecote after the birds have flown. Dennis O'Driscoll was born in County Tipperary and at the age of 16 became a civil servant in Dublin and remained so for 40 years. Consequently, he once referred to himself as the Lord of the Files Whereas personally sociable and warm, many of his poems can be temperamentally compared to those of Philip Larkin in their grumpy evocations of everyday life, of the misery and consolations of work and their droll directness about provincial living. The literary world was deeply shocked when O'Driscoll died in 2012 at the early age of 58. He once said that one of the fundamental emotions in my poetry is empathy. I have the deepest sense of compassion for the bewilderment that people feel when forced to face on a daily basis all of the daunting things that life throws at them. This poem, Missing God, might be read with this well in mind as it attempts to give voice to what has been lost in a world where the sense of the sacred has receded. 
Throughout the poem, you get no sense that the poet is judging this faith-diminished world as being somehow dishonest, but we wonder whether the poem is an ambiguous but prophetic warning against an impoverished imagination and colorless universe. Is this a cry from a heart that rejects faith but needs it? A lament for a belief in God that can't be retrieved because the gaps and questions that God once filled have been replaced, but which now open up a melancholic absence. When I read this poem, I often think of Graham Greene's comment that the trouble is, I don't quite believe my unbelief. I often wonder, in this early part of the 21st century, whether the day-to-day -day language we use is actually a lot more secular than we really are. Beyond the blushes that occur when religion is spoken of in public, is the private heart of many still in search of epiphany, meaning, transcendence, God? Is Augustine as right as he ever was that our hearts today are still restless until they rest there? Does the title of this poem, Missing God, refer to the fact that we now miss God because he's disappeared or can't be believed, dismissed by a secular worldview? Or does it also mean we miss him as in we fail to see him, not looking so are not finding, missing him whilst he's there, perhaps both. What is clear is there is some warning here about something that is taken away when we don't have the patience, the imagination, the attention or the trust that belief in God invites us to pursue. All of us who have belief, of course, go through periods of both missing God because he seems to have gone, or missing him in the way in which he's working in our lives and world. As Emily Dickinson said, the doubts and the faith, the reverence and rebellion, the devotion and derelictions that come and go, keep believing nimble. And it was the same Christ who taught his friends to pray, Our Father, who recited a poem as he died with the words, My God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? To be honest about doubt is to stay in relationship, but to exorcise God is a step far too atheistically fundamentalist for many people for whom an openness about the possibilities of God, a source of life and love, keep the word intriguingly resonant. Against all the odds, we keep on saying God. A French priest in the 1960s was asked why he got ordained. I got ordained, he said, to help keep the rumor of God stay alive on this earth. The sense of what would be lost if the rumour, which many of us believe to be a true one, simply died out, is for a lot of people who may not think of themselves as religious, still a cold and chilling disenchantment of a world that carries within it a deep sense of both miracle and gift. The poet David Constantine says, Poetry keeps on saying what it is we risk losing, what we are losing and what we might do about it. It's a celebration of things that are threatened, things without which life isn't worth it. I can't help but feel this poem is pointing to what we risk losing in the pursuit of some God-free world. We know religions cause a lot of trouble and pain, we know that. But their heartland, their premise, is a sense of awe, gratitude, 
a belief in good relationship, a life in balance, a less self-obsessed blindness, and a deep conviction that love is the compass with which to navigate a life. And all this because God is. The poem notes the dying embers of the faith that in spirited poems of previous generations, such as Gerard Manley Hopkins' God's Grandeur, where the material world was perceived to be charged with God's majesty and a deep down freshness. The poem is ironically written in the form of a religious litany. A litany is a prayer form that often uses anaphora or word repetition. And 16 times at the beginning of each stanza, O'Driscoll repeats the two words, miss him. The two beats of these words are the poem's constant, like the beeps of a life support machine or the short cries of intense despair from a lover forsaken. The cumulative effect, however, does force a revaluation of the mentality and emotion of a world that is no longer sacramental. From the beginning of the poem, we're given impressions of a productive and efficient world that has lost a sense of gratitude. Grace is no longer called for as farmed fish multiply. The poet seems to understand that we have rebelled against a God who was some sort of oppressive father. He refers to the God as bearded hermit, an unworldly being who doesn't go through what the rest of us do. Missing God then goes on to name the places, spaces and moments when the absence of God itself becomes a presence. These include the civil wedding, where the focus of the altar is a bunch of flowers, blossomy, and where there's no intimation of something being everlasting. Likewise, at the crematorium, the choked voices try to console themselves with a reading from Shakespeare's Cymbeline, in which a repetition reminds us that we all come to dust. O'Driscoll seems to be plaintive about that, which the poet Anne Stevenson imagined, of the funeral without a minister, where all the words have nowhere to go, not addressed beyond themselves. Imagine them, she writes, those words, circling and circling the confusing cemetery, roving the earth without anywhere to rest. In Missing God too, he notes how we miss God looking at a crucifix in an art museum. For the Christian, God empties himself in the incarnation and in a body language we know as Jesus Christ, stretches open his arms in an embrace on wood in a cry of forsakenness. But in that moment, it is believed, God has never been nearer Strangely, later in the poem, the poet refers to blood sacrificed anonymously to save life. It is Christ here who is anonymous now, but frustratingly at a time when the freshness and radical nature of his teaching has the potential to transform a material, competitive, rank-infested slog of a life into a spiritual adventure of deepening relationships and trust. If it is true that we're just spending money we don't have on things we don't want in order to impress people we don't like, then the teachings of the one whose ribs now confuse us in a gallery are well overdue to be heard. Similarly, those who trudge past a church and smell incense or hear the monastery bell have a stirring of something other, a sense of strangeness that feels almost like home, but they move on. O'Driscoll says he feels nostalgic, an important word from the Greek nostos, which Odysseus-like 
means a return to your homeland. He recognizes that this return appears impossible, as empty of hope as a dovecot from which the birds have fled. But the magnetism of mystery we know as God no longer draws people out of some burrowing underground unless feeling life is a wheel skidding in snow or a breast lump is newly found and an involuntary prayer escapes our lips. It's likely then to be a prayer of need rather than of praise. The person of faith reading this poem might feel overwhelmed by the picture O'Driscoll paints, but may also feel sympathetic to what is being voiced. We know that those who are seeking the spiritual today, often without a natural vocabulary for their soul, feel that the church is just too secular, too caught up in the things from which they want to be freed. There's no doubt that the community of Christian faith, having spent centuries on working out the form of Christianity, must now concentrate on what it is for. We are being thrown back to our basics. And if there is a crisis of faith, then a good crisis must not go to waste. Perhaps it is time for Christianity to do some stock-taking, self-scrutiny, distillation. In the church, we spend a lot of energy on asking how we might be loyal to the past. Another question emerges in the culture O'Driscoll interrogates. How might this faith be loyal to our future? What is it that might make belief in God a gift to the world again, and not as we seem to behave just to religion? How might faith in God be generous in conversation and learning instead of being defensive and dogmatic? So much talk of God has been punitive in focus over the centuries, a God out to take revenge on human depravity. It's surely time to start talking again, as the scriptures do, of a restorative God who takes it upon himself to uphold human dignity. Although we have often begun with idolatry and ended in violence, for the Christian all must start in wonder and end in humility. The voices in the poem seem to have some consciousness that this might indeed be a way to understand the world and the human heart better. Many of you will know the story of the famous atheist Voltaire on his deathbed. The local parish priest visited him and urged him again and again, you must renounce the devil, monsieur, cast out Satan, you must shun the devil and all his works. Oh, it's a bit late to start making enemies, said Voltaire. Perhaps death keeps God alive for many, but for me, it is all the ordinary miracles of this life, birth and breath, love and loss, music, science, art, relationships, sacrifice and selflessness, and the world's amazing beauty that perhaps appropriately as we end these three talks, all make me believe, even in the face of suffering and shadow, of unanswered questions and doubts that do dance in my head, that lead me to believe that God is in this world as poetry is in the poem. To miss this would be for me, a loss, a great, unbearable loss, and would feel as if it were my humanity itself that had gone missing.
I pray that I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For eight years, I worked across the river at St. Paul's Cathedral. I know, as I said this morning at the Chrism Mass, I saved the best wine till last. St. Paul's is an odd place to work, such a big ballroom of a church, and in many ways it has a ministry to the general public. St. Paul's, in normal times, has thousands of tourists, and though often taken back by the grandeur of the cathedral, they're often confused as to what sort of church it is. One evening, I was leaving the cathedral after Evensong, and a man stopped me. Excuse me, he said with a heavy accent. I'm not sure where he was from. His English was not very good. Excuse me, is this a Roman Catholic church? No, I said, it is Anglican. Anglican, he repeated, puzzled. He didn't know the word. So I tried helpfully to explain. Well, we're not Protestant in that we have no other foundational documents but those of the ancient creeds of the church, but we're not Roman Catholic. We are Catholic, but reformed, established, the Church of England, part of the Anglican Communion, sometimes called Episcopal, and part of the Universal Church, but not in communion with... He looked at me. <laughs> more and more baffled, his eyes glazing over, and he stopped me. Is this Jesus Christ's, he asked. Yes, I said, and we laughed very loudly together. At last, we'd found the words for what mattered. It's very beautiful, he said. I have said my prayer here. And then he gave me a hug and went on his way. His question stayed with me. Is this place Jesus Christ? Is Southwark Cathedral Jesus Christ? Is my home Jesus Christ? Is my heart, my mind, my language, my behavior Jesus Christ? How can we find out? How can we begin to research the answer to those questions? Well, one way would be to ask what is at the heart of Jesus and see if we are there too. And tonight, on Maundy Thursday, you see the heart of Jesus Christ really clearly. In the Middle East of Jesus' day, if someone was wealthy enough to have a servant or two when you arrived at your hosts for dinner, the servant would wash your feet, cleanse them from your journey, make you feel at home, refreshed. And what we find tonight is that Jesus becomes that servant. It would have been very uncomfortable for his friends because it would have been like letting him clean their toilet. It was a degrading act for someone to perform this washing. And then he gives his friends a command that they should do as he has done. What a different view of the world you have from down there. A place where you're not to think less of yourself, but think of yourself less. This commandment to wash each other's feet, by the way, is as strong and as absolute as his command to take bread and wine and remember him by sharing it. Just imagine, though, if instead of communion, the church had decided to center the Sunday and daily services around the washing of feet command 
instead of the bread and wine command. Just imagine what would we have made of it by now. We would be having arguments over which foot should be washed, right or left. There would be the church of the left footers <laughs> and the communion of the right footers. We would have synods on whether the water should be cold or hot, or if Anglican, probably lukewarm. <laughs> We'd be fighting over whether women can wash the feet, whether gay people can have their feet washed, and we would wonder how to behave with those who'd never had their foot washed. Should they attend a podiatrist first? <laughs> we have a very clever knack in the church for concentrating on what doesn't matter to hide what does taking, as I said at my installation, small opportunities to be mean instead of large opportunities to be generous. In that upper room, the contrast, the clarity, is potentially life-changing. By this love you have for one another, people will know you're mine. Feet, they're very strange things. They're used in adverts to show the size of a fetus. We see them on TV, on the slab, on that murder mystery series when there's always a corpse. They poke out of a blanket after another school shooting. Somehow they define us. They certainly go where we go. They get tired like us. They get hard like us. Most people at the end of the day think they're ugly, best kept out of sight. Picking those feet up, he was holding us. And when someone is holding your foot, you just have to stop and feel the tenderness. There's a handbook on church needlework from the 1950s that prescribes the length of the lavabo towel, a towel, that's the cloth that the priest uses to wash her or his hands before presiding. And it says very definitively, it should be 12 inches long for Roman Catholics and 18 inches long for Anglicans. <laughs> it led one poet to comment, oh filthy, dirty Anglican needing the larger towel. Well, yes, we need a large towel in this life. In the Gospels, there are two bowls of water in the story of the Passion. Pilots used to wash hands of others, scrubbing himself of all responsibility and tonight's bowl, where Jesus gently bathes in love. They're always before us, these two bowls, and Jesus shows us that when you place yourself to the side, your soul grows just a little bit more. When your self-obsession is reduced, your life enlarges. You discover you have a soul again. When you see that you might have lots to live with, but little to live for, caught up living as if life is survival of the fittest, but unable to say fit for what, then that's a call back to life. In fact, the lesson Jesus taught that night is that for a human self to be most itself means not being so selfish. But to pick up the towel is not to become a doormat. We are called not to serve people's wants, but their need. To serve need in the name of Christ by sharing what we have, sharing who we are. The church is really here to help school the human heart and it's done with a bowl of water and a Lord who asks us 
to remember him when we eat and drink together. Remember him, that is, remember him. Put him back together in this world. He is entrusting his future in the world to his friends. He entrusts his future in the world to us. Remember me when you come together. Become me. Live my life. You can be ordinary. You can be a bit broken. You can feel passed around and all over the place, but like bread every day, torn apart, shared, like bread, like me, he says, go and nourish this world. Christ takes broken things, broken hearts, broken dreams, broken bread, and repairs and uses with and for love. When the host is placed in our hand, it is him putting his hand into ours. He's with us and he's not going anywhere. In that upper room, we are shown how to research the answer to that man's question. You are shown how you spot a Christian. They love. Is this place Jesus Christ's? The answer is in our hands. Do you please be seated? This is the day when we recall the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And to help us do this, to reflect on the suffering and death of Jesus, we naturally first turn to the Gospels for their depictions of these horrific events. And what we discover there is that from the very beginning, the story of the Passion of Christ was already being shaped by interpretation, by an artistry and imagination. The suffering of the Messiah and his death on an instrument of humiliating torture cried out for explanation, as in many ways it didn't make easy sense. The Messiah was to bring victory and liberation not be bound up by an occupying power and done away with as some second-rate criminal. We find, for instance, the Apostle Paul grappling with the meaning of this death. And along with the evangelists, together in the New Testament, they explore that mystery that has come to be known as atonement, that is, an at one a belief that in some way through this death, God and his world were never closer. Paul and the evangelists work hard in their exploration, using images and metaphors drawn from the things they knew well, for example, the temple or the battlefield, the slave market, the law court, family life, all these images they use to try and piece together models of how this atonement worked through what appeared to be a shameful and an embarrassing end to a life. But no theory of atonement was ever declared to be definitive by the church. In the creeds, we simply hear that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Influential thinkers through the centuries have offered theories of the atonement that they have made sound pretty definitive, but in fact their theories are part of a much larger collection of ideas that have come and sometimes gone in the life of the church that still refuses to be definitive in interpretation. Instead, 
the hearers of the story of Christ's passion and death are encouraged to find meaning in their own response, like listening to a piece of music, and to place this story near to their own stories of suffering in life to see what connects or resonates in their own lives of faith. And sometimes meaning doesn't just come on demand. We just sit and pray. Now, because of this openness to interpretation, to the search for meaning in the death of Jesus, the desire, if you like, to see in the dark, it shouldn't surprise us to learn that the poets of the world have been drawn through the centuries to use their art and imagination to help excavate understanding. When the story of the passion is told in English language poetry, we can often identify versions of the great models of atonement that have been developed here and there, but we can also find these images combined in new, provocative ways, producing open spaces rather than closed off doctrines. So in this time together, in which Christ was nailed to the cross, we here shall look at just a few of the poets who have opened up channels into the meaning of this death and how God comes close and reveals his nature to us as Christ breathes his last. We shall look at how some early Anglo-Saxons understood this, how some in the medieval period did, and also then in the 20th century, looked at the cross and saw in the dark. And as we do this, so also our hymns, which are of course poems, will reflect their different centuries. If you like, we will be praying with our spiritual ancestors. We have already heard a poem. We just sang Samuel Crossman's My Song is Love Unknown. Crossman, a former Dean of Bristol, was a 17th century contemporary of John Milton and for a long while shared Milton's Puritan theology. Milton himself had once tried to write a poem on the passion, but later admitted that the subject was above the years he had when he wrote it. Milton was never to return to the theme, actually. In Paradise Lost, the cross is given just three lines. But Crossman did approach the topic, and although some of the power of the verse actually comes from phrases he nicked from George Herbert, love unknown, and never was love, dear king, never was grief like thine, Crossman relates the suffering of Christ to himself. It is my song, my saviour, oh, who am I that may I say, my friend indeed, so much that here might I stay and sing. The cross is bound up with personal meaning. Indeed, Crossman's life without this friend would have all his days spent very differently, and you discern much poorer. This is the first theme of the poems we will encounter in this devotion. The truth that the cross of Christ, though difficult to understand or summarize, is of profound life-giving importance to each Christian soul trying to glimpse something here into the nature of God. Not just an example, but a sample of God's true nature and of how God relates to us, how God loves us just as we are, how God loves us so much he doesn't want us to stay like that. So we discover in the poets that the suffering of Jesus and his death are caught up with our meaning, but also somehow with God's too with God's life and being, with God's love and hiddenness 
and communication. The poets, of course, will not spell out exactly or conclusively how these things might be understood or embraced. Instead, we are given a gift of a rich and complex web of metaphors and symbols, if you like, a collage pointing towards an imperfectly understood reality. Just like religious language itself. In the life of faith, what we long for most finally always eludes us because desire, not a rival, is the heartbeat of faith. Only hints and guesses today so that through a poetic spirituality which seeks to deepen the mystery of God, not resolve it, we may grow into the spaces that God's silence offers as Jesus takes his last breaths. God is in the world as poetry is in the poem, and never more than in that baffling, moving, tragic, painful, resonant place we call Calvary. From the dream of the rood. Then that most noble tree spoke. It was long since, I yet remember it, that I was hewn at Holt's end, moved from my stem. Strong fiends seized me there, worked me for spectacle. Cursed ones lifted me on shoulders, men bore me there, then fixed me on hill. Fiends enough fastened me. Then saw I mankind's Lord come with great courage when he would mount on me. Then dared I not against the Lord's word bend or break when I saw earth's fields shake. All fiends I could have felled, but I stood fast. The young hero stripped himself. He, God Almighty, strong and stout-minded, he mounted high gallows, bold before many, when he would loose mankind. I shook when that man clasped me. I dared still not bow to earth, fall to earth's fields, but had to stand fast. Rude was I reared. I lifted a mighty king, lord of the heavens, dared not to bend. With dark nails they drove me through, on me those sores are seen, open malice wounds. I dare to not scathe anyone. They mocked us both, we two together. All wet with blood I was, poured out from that man's side, after ghost he gave up. Much have I borne on that hill of fierce fate. I saw the God of hosts harshly stretched out. Darknesses had wound round with clouds the corpse of the wielder, bright radiance. A shadow went forth, dark under heaven. All creation wept. King's fall lamented. Christ was en route. I spoke in my introduction of that creative opening up of space that poetry can give to us, resistant to the idea that truth is simply information. The poem I want to look at here is a good example of this. The poem you just heard probably comes from the early 8th century, one of the very earliest Christian poems in English and a long extract from it can still be seen in runic form carved on a cross in Ruthel in Dumfrieshire. 
It's been given the title, The Dream of the Rood. Rood was originally the only old English word for the instrument of Christ's death. The words cross and crucifix came later. And the early English poetic, enigmatic mind was captured by this rood of Christ. In this poem, of which we heard only a part of its 156 lines and whose author remains unknown, the narrator describes a strange dream of a wonderful tree covered with gems, and he is aware of how wretched he is in comparison. But then he sees that amidst all the beautiful stones, this tree is stained with blood. The tree then speaks and tells us that it was cut down to bear a criminal, but a young warrior who is Lord of mankind climbed him. This rood is not only vocal, but has emotions. And gradually a mysterious identity forms between the wood and the warrior, the rood and the ruler. The dark nails that pierce the warrior pierce the tree too. Darkness overwhelms them both. Though the emotions depicted are complex, the narrative itself is swift and spare, and the climax is quickly reached. All creation wept, kings fall, lamented. Christ was on rude. The tree speaks not only for the cosmos, but as part of it, and then charges the narrator to share all that he's seen with others. The vision ends and the man is left with his thoughts, finding himself filled with some hope. The poet doesn't explore the events that lead up to the crucifixion, and this is usual for Christian art and literature of this period. Instead, we're focused on the cross itself. Ever since the Emperor Constantine, who had said that he would conquer in the sign of the cross, the potency of the cross as a force against evil and the foe was explored in patterns of poetry. The feast of the exaltation of the cross had been instituted in the church in the seventh century and two hymns that had been written in honor of a large relic of the true cross were sung for that feast. And you sang one of them just now. And the author of The Dream of the Rood may have sung that same hymn as you did. For there are some signs of liturgical influence on that poem. Written by the bishop and poet Fortunatus, this Latin hymn, like many of the time, sing of Christ's battle won and of warfare ended. Likewise, though not as triumphalistic, the image of Christ in the poem of the Rood is that of an Anglo-Saxon hero warrior. That's who Christ is in this poem. Indeed, the poet actually uses a native phrase for Christ that is once applied to that other hero, Beowulf. However, the poem builds up in crescendo to the true identity of this hero who is coming to the tree. The rood tells us how this young warrior actively strips himself for the fight, hastens with resolute courage to climb the tree, and then rests limb weary after the exhaustion of single combat as Lord of Victories, watched over by his faithful followers. By contrast, the cross remembers how it was pierced with dark nails, drenched with blood, endured many grievous wrongs from wicked men, was wounded with weapon points, 
stood weeping and was finally leveled to the ground. All the sympathy and pathos of the reader are directed towards the cross. The comparison between the cross and the crucified one corresponds to the relation between the human nature of Christ, the rude, and the divine Son of God, the warrior. But suffering in this poem is very much caught up with victory. Victory over what or whom isn't spelt out exactly as it is in some Latin poems such as the one we just sang. What is striking about this poem is that it offers no explanation or theory as to how the victory and the suffering converge. The impression given is that the victory interprets the suffering, but we can't quite see how. All we do know from the poem is that the passion is not understood as tragedy, but as a fulfillment of divine purpose. Here we have a Lord who does not courageously know what has to be done alone. In some early Christian art, this is made very evident in some depictions by Christ climbing up a ladder onto the cross, freely taking upon himself the cost of a savior. Christ being shown rather like a fireman going up the steps to the window through which he will end his life. As another early poem of this period says, man stole the fruit, but I must climb the tree. This ascending is purposeful, accepting the divine will. Here, Christ eagerly leaps onto the cross to do battle with death. The cross is a sort of loyal retainer, paradoxically forced to participate in his Lord's execution. But here, Jesus is no helpless victim. He is a warrior hero who, to use contemporary comparisons, is enlisted by God for a cosmic regime change, a man giving his life as an enlisted peacekeeper. We're reminded of the combat that goes into shaping our soul for good or evil. Goodness here is being fought for. It doesn't just happen. And the good of our humanity is likewise fought for. This non-specific nature of Christ's triumph draws readers into making connections for themselves, as does the narrator himself, who ends by reflecting on his own life, in which he feels many yearnings within himself. Above all others, this poem betrays the spirit of tender yet passionate veneration, of awe and adoration for the wondrous cross on which we often sing, the Prince of Glory died. See how that theme was passed on, the Prince of Glory. And of course, we only need to look round a cathedral or a church to see how the cross in the spirit of our poet is made a fruitful tree with its branches reaching out and flowering. This is the cross that Christ, those early poets say, could not ever have avoided or fled from. He goes to it resolute, with purpose. He doesn't think twice for you. He loves you, wants to protect you, fight for you, and die for you. That is how much we are caught up in the being and love of God. And that Anglo-Saxon poet of the dream of the rude is in awe of that tree who was also cut down and raised up, but who never forgot that day when he saw the God of hosts stretched out.
from the commonplace book of John Grimstone. Lova me brauter and lova me rauter, man to be thy fairer. Lova me fedder and lova me ledder, and lova me let it hearer. Lova me slough and lova me draw, and lova me laid on bearer. Lova is me pez for love each s man to buy and dearer. Ne dread thee not, I have thee salt, both in day and night, to harven thee, well is me. I have a thee won and in fight. Love brought me, and love wrought me, to be man your friend. Love fed me, and love led me, and love kept me here. Love slew me, and love drew me, and love laid me out on the bier. Love is my peace, and for love I chose to redeem man at such cost. Don't be afraid, for I have looked for you both day and night in order to be your haven, and I am well. I have won you in the fight. We have just looked at how the Anglo-Saxon poetic tradition explored the relationship between Christ's suffering and his victory, that hero leader who ascends the rood to save his people by battling with evil and death, protecting his own, destroying the destructive in some later medieval poetry, we can find some overlap of thought where Christ is the courtly lover knight who tries to woo the lady human soul and win her love through a jousting conflict with her enemies. In one lyric, the cross is indeed like a horse which Christ, in the coat armour of human nature, rides to this purpose. My palfrey is of tree, he says. But, on the whole, in the period from the 12th century onwards, a shift occurs, taking us away from such victorious and heroic imagery. Instead of Christ the glorious warrior, we now begin to find an intense meditation beginning on the suffering humanity of Jesus. The medieval period was characterized by a revolution of feeling, a new interest in the human figure of Jesus, and by an imaginative reflecting on his human life and pain Spiritual writers such as Richard Roll and Julian of Norwich focus on the bleeding wounds of Jesus as objects for devotion. But they are not now wounds that are incidental to a battle, but they are an expression of divine love and pity, which in turn awakens pity and love in the observer. The regal crown of Christ victorious is now replaced in this period by a crown of thorns. This love of the Saviour becomes fragile. People acquainted with wars and with the plague see now a suffering and death that they well understand. Christ incarnates their own pain and reveals the nature of God as one who comes alongside us in our grief. In a leprosy hospital chapel in France, we find a crucifix with Jesus 
looking like a leper. Christ the King is now the man of sorrows, his sorrows and theirs. We even start in this period to find carved figures of the wounded Christ detached from the cross so one was able to focus on his pierced heart and on his five wounds, described in one poem as the wound words that lie on the book of Christ's body that we open up into a view of God. Very different from the Anglo-Saxon focus on the cross, we now find these depictions of Christ separated off the cross so that we can see his body. In art, not least in rude screens that were now being built, Christ's eyes now close in death. His skin turns white. The blood becomes visible. And the Virgin Mary and St. John appear for the first time at the foot of the cross. That is, the personal relations of family and friends are brought near to this suffering, making this suffering his and theirs, identifiable with. And so it is in this period that poetry, music, and devotion begin to address the pain of Christ's mother and direct compassion towards her. Emotionally, the poets are so involved with the scene of the crucifixion that they are impelled even to address Mary herself and to compare her pain, her pierced soul, to that of her son we find an intensification of feeling taking place at a time when Christian drama, as distinct from liturgical drama, is also being born. This feeling begins to make the crucifixion seem a contemporary event, a continuously present drama in which we are involved and it is pity, pity, that is the prime emotion. Marjorie Kemp, in her 15th century writing, at one point tells Our Lady to cease sorrowing for her son because her son is out of pain now and Marjorie takes Our Lady home where she made a good caudal of broth to comfort her. This is devout creativity, praying as though one was bodily present with Jesus's relatives. A good example of these intensities is Stabat Mater Dolorosa, a hymn version of which we just sang. This is a hymn composed sometime in the 12th or 13th centuries by an unknown author. It was introduced into the liturgy in the later Middle Ages and many English versions were written that are notable for this tenderness of feeling that shapes the poetry of the passion at this time. The simple form of the poem each stanza of three lines, having the first two lines rhyming and the third line rhyming with the third line of the next stanza, gives this impression of a calm, mournful progression that is somber and tender. The name Mary is never mentioned. She becomes the archetypal mother and this a poem about human suffering and mothers losing their children, of which many 
were doing at that time as much as about the Virgin Mary. Is there one who would not weep at this sight? The hymn asks. Tears here are a grace, not a disgrace. The poem we heard read, first in Middle English and then in a contemporary translation, from the commonplace book of John Grimston from 1372, shows how love, more than courage, is now being placed at the heart of atonement, at the heart of God. Christ is the victim of his love, more than its champion. In a similar vein, it is at this time that Christ also begins to be addressed himself as mother by such as Julian of Norwich, speaking of the homeliness of God's love, of its nurture and protection. It's a very welcome introduction of the feminine into the nature of divine love. This love should also, of course, be at the heart of us. And this belief also begins to come through the writings of the time. For the intensification of feeling that sees Christ as vulnerable as we are, and which also at the same time alerts us to that human suffering in the world, leads to a belief that devotion should be translated into action. As one poet of the time has Christ say, to carry my cross is to carry my words in your heart. We find a confidence that the revelation of the love of God in the cross will actually create love in hard and sinful hearts. The divine revelation entailing human re-evaluation. C.S. Lewis later pursued this idea with his Aslan Christ, defrosting human beings back into the divine image. The 14th century Walter Hilton writes, don't spend all your time meditating on the passion to the neglect of your fellow Christian. Wash Christ's feet by attending to your subjects and your tenants. If devotion comes not with mind of the passion, strive not to press too much thereafter. The suffering of Christ was always identified in the least of the brethren. If in the Middle Ages the sufferings of humanity came to be concentrated in those of one man, his suffering in turn came to give meaning to those of the world. And the commandment of love was clear and found in the instructions, for instance, of a monastic order from the period telling the brothers and the abbot to kiss poor men with mouth and eyes, that is to touch and see them eye to eye and to see Christ in them and not look away. At the end of the 15th century, carols appeared in a court songbook called the Fairfax Manuscript and many of the themes there are based on the passion of Christ. The words decisively determined a musical effect. One of those poems may be written by the monk, John Lydgate, who died around 1450, was set to music by Sheringham about 50 years later. And in that poem, very much in the spirit of the time's devotion, he calls on gentle Jesus. He observes the suffering of the cross and is told by Jesus to think on this lesson that now 
I teach thee. It is a lesson, he says, a place for the soul to learn from. And it speaks, he says, still. Song for Holy Saturday by James K. Baxter. When his tears ran down like blood, I was sleeping in my clothes. When they struck him with a reed, I cracked a very clever joke. When they gave him a shirt of blood, I praised the color of her dress. All the way up the hill, we were laughing fit to kill. When they were driving in the nails, I listened to the steel guitar. When they gave him gall to drink, we were sipping the same glass. When he cried aloud in pain, we were playing Judas's. When the ground began to shake, we pulled up the coverlet. Clean, confessed, and comforted to the midnight mass I come. You who died in pain alone, break my heart, break my heart. Deus sine termino. And so we move finally with a big jump because of course I'd love to keep you here all day to explore the 17th century, the 19th century, but time is limited, so we've jumped into the 20th. A century that understood tragedy, loss, destruction and death from the Somme to Auschwitz, Hiroshima, to Rwanda. Amongst the death of so many, what is so important about the death of one outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago? But it might be that it is exactly because there are so many that statistics cannot be imagined that the death of one brings home to the heart the death of all. And so many 20th century writers have still been drawn to the passion of Christ. The soldier poets of the First World War, for instance, such as Wilfred Owen, use the crucified to distill a sense of what they were doing in the trenches and who they were becoming there. Owen speaks of Christ being in no man's land on the cross. And here in his At a Calvary near the Anchor, he sees a crucifix in France placed significantly at a crossroads that has been damaged in cross fire. Cross fire. One ever hangs where shelled roads part. In this war, he too lost a limb, but his disciples hide apart, and now the soldiers bear with him. Near Golgotha strolls many a priest, and in their faces there is pride that they were flesh-marked by the beast by whom the gentle Christs denied. The scribes on all the people shove and brawl allegiance to the state, but they who love the greater love lay down their lives. They do not hate. Here Owen, like that soldier at the foot of the cross, is able to see the righteous Son of God when the chief priests of organized religion are busy blessing armies. 
He sees sense in the teachings of the man who is crucified, the man of sorrows who understands what Owen and his colleagues are undergoing. But Christ is here less adored than respected. But there is a mutuality, a recognition of the greater power of love, even when put to death, of the greater integrity of the peace-loving, even when butchered, going over the top. Robert Graves, after the war, wrote that even when respect for organized religion died amongst the men, reverence for Jesus as our fellow sufferer remained. Others begin to wonder whether God is suffering too. In this war, he too, writes Owen, has lost a limb. Such a move towards believing that God suffers is also found in that hymn we just sang by W.H. Vanston, an Anglican priest who died about 13, 14 years ago. Therefore he who shows us God helpless hangs upon the tree and the nails and crown of thorns tell of what God's love must be. Here is God, no monarch he, throned in easy state to reign. Here is God, whose arms of love aching, spent, the world sustain. One of the reflections of the atonement that has drawn people in the 20th century is that of Christ the scapegoat. Knowing that human beings like to identify a common enemy, usually an outsider, to keep their group together, an embodiment of evil on which they can throw their violence, we're seeing quite a lot of it at the moment, we find Jesus asking his followers to break such cycles of retributive hatred and to learn to touch the untouchable. Instead of the one being castigated by the 99, he tells a story of leaving the 99 to find the one. And he dies as the unjustly persecuted scapegoat who willingly takes our violence on himself to break the circle and stop others being scapegoated on, praying even as he dies for forgiveness and not revenge. He absorbs hate without passing it on and bids his followers do the same so that the mechanisms of projected hate are broken. He dies as we must live. The poem we heard read was written by the New Zealand poet James K. Baxter, not half as well known here in the UK as he is in his home country. Baxter died in 1972, he was only 46. But in that relatively short life, he wrote over 600 pages of political, lyrical and spiritual poems born in an extraordinary life that saw him convert to Anglicanism and then to Roman Catholicism and then at the end living as a countercultural guru, sometimes affected by alcoholism and drug use. His poetry is scarred with 20th century abuse. A life lived safely for him threatened his art but his poems are often profoundly sensitive to the being of God, to the cry of the poor, to the needs of community. He hated what he called the modern world's depersonalization, centralization, and desacralization. And angry and offensive as many of his poems are, 
he said he could still find reason for hope in the hearts of people. Surrender, he writes in one of his poems, surrender to the sky, your heart of anger. He once recalled how he wrote his first poem. I climbed up to a hole in a bank above the sea and there fell into the attitude of listening out of which poems may rise, not to the sound of the sea, but to the unheard sound of which poems are translations. The unheard sound of which poems are translations. In his song for Holy Saturday, with its stabbing couplets, we hear of the distractedness and indifference of 20th century folk to the events of Christ's passion and seeing himself caught up in this indifference, he prays, you who died in pain alone, break my heart, break my heart. The crucifixion here is not provoking him to wonder whether God is absent, but whether he is. We are fooling around, trying to make our mark and enjoy life whilst absent from ourselves and from those unheard sounds that lie deep down. Baxter was always drawn to those soldiers who played dice at the foot of the cross. Yes, that's what we'd be doing, he says. His word play draws this out. We crack jokes as the whip cracks. The steel nails are not heard because of the steel guitar. This is a Christ who is raised up but is not seen because we haven't yet seen ourselves. The poem ends speaking of God without end. If the cross and suffering of his Christ broke his heart, then life might begin to seep into him. Christ needing to rescue us from what he calls our civilized darkness. His soul needing to be shocked by the love and fidelity of Calvary wondering why he might not be able to be faithful and love like this man being tortured, he keeps asking deeper questions of who we've become and alerts us to the fact that we can't save ourselves. We can't heal ourselves. This has to come from outside, from lovers, both human and divine. With all our advances, scientific, military capability, vaccinated against feeling by distraction and the global, we need saving from ourselves, he says. The poet W.H. Auden, another 20th century poet, in one of his poetic sequences, used the crucified Jesus as the fixed point of reference the victim whom we, in our ordinary round of busy city lives, kill daily without letting ourselves acknowledge just what we've done between noon and three. A nice late afternoon siesta wipes out our memory of shouting with the crowd for his death. Waking refreshed, he writes, we have time to misrepresent Excuse, deny, mythify, use this event while under a hotel bed in prison, down wrong turnings, its meaning waits for our lives. The poems we have looked at today, between noon and three, all in their various diverse ways, have the cross as the fixed point and invite us to recognize that its meaning waits for our lives. 
God, at the end of prose, writes the Australian poet Les Murray, somehow be our poem. At the very end of this devotion, we will hear from the poet R.S. Thomas, who died in 2000. Seamus Heaney called him the Clint Eastwood of the Spirit. And in the poem we will hear the musician, we hear a response to the cross. May God, through your prayers this day and your life from now on, find your response, bring you peace, and at one with him so that we may live lives of gratitude, secure in the belief that God is in the world, is on the cross, is in your imperfect human heart, just as poetry is in the poem. I'm going to now offer at the end of this address short prayers which were written through the different generations, centuries that we've just looked at. So let us pray. A prayer of the ruler and poet King Alfred the Great from the ninth century. Lord God Almighty, I pray you for your great mercy and by the token of the holy rood, guide me to your will, to my soul's need, better than I can myself, and shield me against my foes, seen and unseen, and teach me to do your will, that I may love you inwardly before all things with a clean mind and a clean body, for you are my maker and redeemer my help, my comfort, my trust, and my hope. Praise and glory be to you now, Lord of the rude, ever and ever, and world without end. Amen. A prayer of Marjorie Kemp from the 15th century. Our dear God, I have not loved you for all my life, and now I bitterly regret the time when I ignored you. I ran away from you, yet you ran after me. So now, for all my impurity, you have given me hope, and I bless you. And finally, a prayer of Jim Cotter from the 20th century. God bless this city and move our hearts with pity lest we grow hard. God bless this place with silence, solitude and space that we may pray. God bless these days of rough and narrow ways, lest we despair. God bless the night and calm the people's fright that we may love. God bless this land and guide us with your hand, lest we be unjust. God bless this earth through pangs of death and birth and make us whole. Amen. The Musician by R.S. Thomas. A memory of Chrysler once, at some recital in this same city. The seats all taken, I found myself pushed onto the stage with a few others, so near that I could see the toil of his face muscles a pulse like a moth fluttering under the fine skin and the indelible veins of his smooth brow. I could see, too, the twitching of the fingers caught temporarily in art's neurosis. 
as we sat there or warmly applauded. This player who so beautifully suffered for each of us upon his instrument. So it must have been on Calvary, in the fiercer light of the thorns halo, the men standing by and that one figure, the hands bleeding, the mind bruised but calm, making such music as lives still, and no one daring to interrupt because it was himself that he played. And closer than all of them, the God listened. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please be seated. At Easter, I always think back to those who encouraged me in my first love of God. Some of the clergy who influenced me were in many ways, looking back, frankly, a bit bonkers. Beautifully bonkers, but bonkers. I remember one Sunday morning, for instance, when my slightly eccentric vicar, after administering communion at the altar, suddenly, in full vestments, walked down the aisle and out of the church door. We then all heard him start up his car and drive off. We sat there, a little embarrassed, not quite knowing what to do, but being very polite Anglicans, as Alan Bennett might have said, we didn't say anything. <laughs> About five minutes later, we heard his car come back at great speed, screeched to a halt, the door slammed, and he walked up the aisle, still in full vestments, and at the altar said in a loud voice, I left the chicken on high, let us pray. It's good to hear laughter, and medieval Bavarians would have been very proud of you because we know that they enjoyed something called Rhesus Pascalis, the laughter of Easter. When the preacher would often encourage the congregation on this day to celebrate the Lord's resurrection by prolonged laughter. And if this was rather difficult to get going, as I suspect it was, he would tell jokes to help it along. And it appears that these jokes were not sophisticated. In fact, they were a bit saucy. It must have been a bit like carry on up the pulpit. <laughs> Apparently, bishops didn't like it and tried to stamp it out. But I would have given it a go this morning, except, as you will know, I don't know any such rude jokes. <laughs> anyway, the point is this. It was thought that laughter was the only true way of celebrating Christ's resurrection. Laughter was a promise of redemption, and faith was the intuition that that promise was being kept. Laughter leveled drew people together, revealed foibles, kept pomposity in its place, hinted at something uncontrollably transcendent. I hope this cathedral will continue always to be a place of laughter, kind, joyful laughter, with, not at, people. And I'm hoping secretly that there will be a court jester employed at the next General Synod to keep everyone in check by bashing them on the head with a balloon from time to time. A bit of whoops, there goes my mitre might be a quite helpful. <laughs> but for all this, we have to acknowledge that it isn't laughter that we initially find in the gospel today, but tears. 
Mary is crying. She's there for all of us as she's asked, why are you weeping? Well, where do we begin? For the beauty of the world groaning under pollution and plastic, for those whose life will end in parts of the world most of us will never see while we sit here because of military or terrorist aggression and unspeakable cruelties that make us nervous of putting the news on? Or will we cry out of fear for those who are just about struggling to get by? Or for a Western world now being described not as post-war, but pre-war? Or will there be tears of anger for the demise of truth in public debate, for black lives that don't matter to some, or tears for those seeking refuge who are more like us than we like to admit, or tears for those in this our city being killed by knives or drugs, or for the fact that a popular Times columnist can yesterday speak of human lives as units in deficit or surplus to the collective. Or will it be tears for our own life, for the one we've lost, the bed we can't manage to get out of because the day ahead feels unbearable? Or those tears of the Western world, having enough to live with but not much to live for? Mary stood weeping. She understands. And tears are a gift. Good things often begin when we let ourselves cry. The question that begins the spiritual life is asked by Jesus, tell me, why are you weeping? Upset, Mary seems to want everything as it had been, to take hold of the one she loves, to put everything together as it once was. Again, we understand. If only I could be back there as it used to be, it was all good then, that's us. But Jesus is teaching Mary the next step in the spiritual adventure. He teaches us that too often we would rather keep him with us where we are than let him take us where he is going. It is better to let him take hold of us. In other words, if you're serious about your tears, about the hard full stops in you being turned into commas, then align your life to the journey of an unpredictable God, not to places where you feel safe but half dead. He gave us a prayer to help us. Your kingdom come, not my kingdom stay. And there will be no resurrection to celebrate if, just as he rises and reaches out his hand, we bury ourselves. Unless we dare to let go of who we are, we will never become who we might yet be. And it always takes risks to become you, the you that God longs to see come to fruition. And it often hurts before we can hear our own name spoken with love. But when we do, we're aware of everything that we've borne in the past and all that we haven't yet been. And it's all in that one word, Mary. Her name heard, Mary is lastly given a mission, to go into the city. She's to go into the center of religious and political life where decisions are made, where the poor look for help, where neighbors don't know each other very well, where a lot of foreigners pitch up, where you can feel very important or very ignored. And it's there where resurrection faith, that is the faith that we are shouting about today, must find its way through. As the poet Manly Hopkins prays, may he, Easter in us, be a dayspring to the dimness of us. Mary's thoughts are ours, of course. What can little me do in such a big city and a world in need of such repair? So start resurrecting hope. One person, one relationship, one day at a time. 
Cynicism is the enemy. I've always been inspired by Martin Luther's comment that even if I knew the world would end tomorrow, I would still plant my little apple tree. So, that story we heard is about tears in a world of murder and grief, about fear in changing or having courage for a totally new way of being you, cities and towns longing for fresh vision to arrive, probably in women rather than men in suits. Hmm. And some say this story has no relevance. Nothing could be more urgent. Faith in the resurrection is not a story we tell to see if you like it or not. As St. John and those first story keepers knew, it was a story that was only just beginning to be continued in you and me. Can we use the gift of our tears and with a heart's release follow Jesus Christ as our new compass to navigate this world? If you believe in Christ's resurrection, it is time to stand up for this faith, to come out of your tomb, to become an ambassador for love and for hope, or else, what is the point? I want to end with a story. When I was in the United States in 2015, there was a young, unarmed black man shot dead by a policeman in Ferguson, Missouri. His name was Michael Brown. A makeshift memorial was built up on the street where he died, and there was a cardboard box painted black with gold letters written on it. They simply said, they tried to bury us. They didn't know we are seeds. Those words had been used by indigenous people in Mexico, were originally written by a Greek poet marginalized throughout his life. You did anything to bury me, he wrote, but you forgot I was a seed. Today, Christ speaks those words and speaks them still wherever there is oppression. The story is clear. And in the resurrection appearances, when Jesus appears, he often says in translation in our Bibles, peace be with you, sounding a bit like a vicar. What he says is shalom, which is really, hi, it's me. I'm here where we always were. I'm not going anywhere. My place is with you. I love you and I will always, always be here with you. His is a love that is much stronger than the worst thing you have ever done. Death is dead and love has taken its place. As in Mary, so in us. The tomb is empty, so make this day the beginning of your new life. I've led reflections through this week using poems, so I must end with a short one now, and one which has an extraordinary final image just for today. It is by George Herbert, and it is called The Dawning. Awake, sad heart, whom sorrow ever drowns. Take up thine eyes, which feed on earth. Unfold thy forehead, gathered into frowns. Thy saviour comes, and with him, mirth. Awake, awake and with a thankful heart his comforts take. But thou dost still lament and pine and cry and feel his death, but not his victory. 
Arise, sad heart, if thou dost not withstand Christ's resurrection, thine may be. Do not by hanging down break from the hand which as it riseth, raiseth thee. Arise, arise, and with his burial linen dry thine eyes. Christ left his grave clothes that we might, when grief draws tears or blood, not want a handkerchief. <laughs>